Hi, my name is Bob Grinier, and I'm a volunteer with the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project. Well, it is good to be back and to be able to share some things with you. I wanted to talk about the work of S.V. Adamenko, and principally I wanted to move towards explaining a little bit more my feelings about one of my slides which I presented at Sochi in October 2018, and I'll come on to that, but firstly, I think it's necessary to read some of what Adamenko has said over the years and look at who he has collaborated with, who he is collaborating with. And for me, that point that I made in the Sochi presentation, where I think the most interesting data lay. Okay, so this was a comment I made as part of a presentation called What Really Is New Fire Fuel? And that was two years ago that I put this together. And basically I'm saying it's a, it's a natural phenomena and uh, all the maths in the world doesn't help you very easily when you have so many elements and so many permutations. But if you just look at what the crust of the earth is, then your answer is the crust of the earth in my view. And uh, I've explained that well in the past. In this presentation, I talked a little bit about uh, the work of uh, at S.V. Adamenko here. And uh, what I want to draw your attention to is that I have been making the argument, actually, <laughs> since this document and even before, that uh, the active agent in Lena is intrinsically linked to the observation of strange radiation and that they are potentially the same thing for the most interesting sort of self-sustaining uh, aspects of strange radiation. And we know that from the work of Adamenko working with Vladimir Vysotsky in the early 2000s, they used their relativistic discharge target here and uh, they had this metal dielectric semiconductor detector that was outside of the device uh, with a little pump oil film on the the front there, some aluminium, some silicon dioxide and some silicon. So that's the basis of the detector and they observe these new kinds of radiation uh, in their view, although they have been observed before. I've shown many of occasions where that's been observed, but it is the classic kind of uh, zigzag track and you can see that that was observed by the likes of Leclerc and we observed it in uh, several different ways in the work of ECHO, my analysis of that fuel. Anyway, so what I'm saying and I have tried to demonstrate that uh, strange radiation can form, it would appear, magnetic monopoles and that this is, in my view, uh, the kind of part of the technology that leads you to a point of self-sustaining because monopoles at a certain strength in theory, and this has been known for a very long time, can catalytically pull together material and even cause the decay of anything with a proton in it, which is basically all atoms as we know them. So I then said about three years ago, I asked, where did the technology of Stanislav Adamenko and the Ukrainian Proton 21 lab go? And I spoke about the fact that I looked at a particular paper and it would appear that it had been shifted to the US. And in that, I referenced this paper and I will come to that in a second. I just want to look at some old work done between Adamenko and Vysotsky in, I think, 2003 or early 2000s. This is the actual reactor that did the tests. A beautiful thing. This is, again, the setup that you would see. And these are the different um, tests that they used to look at the different samples. The point that I wanted to look at here is the synthesized isotope ratios. So what we have here is that the carbon has a massive overrepresentation of 13, which is the fermionic isotope of carbon. And I am suggesting that fermions, if they are synthesized in the core, get ejected. In the case of magnesium, there's an underrepresentation, but it's pushing towards heavier elements. So again, you have overrepresentation of the uh, 25 isotope. Here you have massive overrepresentation of the 87 isotope. Here in the case of zirconium you have unbelievably high representation of the 91 isotope. Uh, here in the case of iron you have a overrepresentation of iron 57 and in nickel you have nearly all um, 
uh, nickel 62 synthesized or very large proportion which is actually a rare isotope and this was actually in the patent of S.V. Adamenko and nickel 62 and iron 56 they are the ones that basically the dead end for fission and fusion uh, according to uh, sort of standard science uh, understanding. Now, the other thing that's very interesting here is the very high representation of nickel 61. And when we looked at uh, ICPMS on the coral twist sample from John Hutchison, uh, then uh, in that case in Sochi, uh, they also found uh, a very high overrepresentation of nickel 61. And so if you are to look at samples of, for instance, aluminium that were transmuted with this technology and you were to look at the uh, nickel isotope ratios, then you would see this 61 uh, nickel uh, isotope massively overrepresented in my view. Uh, and we have multiple data points now to uh, say that with some uh, relative certainty. And uh, this means that you will know that the technology that did something to that aluminium had to have been the same technology that uh, John Hutchison was using and that Stanislav Adamenko was using, at least in some way. And then there's palladium and neodymium there. So I will then go and look at this paper and I have it here. It shows the thinking on the 28th of October 2003 by Vysotsky and Adamenko. It's a smaller paper. And it says, this paper presents a brief review of existing approaches to the creation of super heavy nuclei in collisions of heavy nuclei to overcome the Coulomb barrier or through the pion condensation in a nucleus volume. Pion condensation in a nucleus volume. Something is causing a load of nuclei to condense into a volume of the size of a nucleus. For a neutral atom compressed by external forces, a threshold electron density is shown to exist. If such a density is reached, a self-organizing process of electron downfall to the nucleus starts. This process is exogenic and leads to the formation of a supercompressed electron nuclear cluster. The synthesis proceeds through the absorption of other nuclei by the collapsed nucleus. So this thing is pulling in other nuclei. The release of binding energy through the absorption of nuclei by the electron nuclear collapsed clusters may result in the simultaneous emission of lighter nuclei. So this is what I'm saying was observed in the work of uh, Piantelli. Uh, something is made that then pulls in other nuclei and then it spits out lighter, lighter nuclei. And I am suggesting that if it is fermionic, that's preferentially ejected. That is a proton and that is tritium. And we've seen proton being ejected from cloud chamber experiments by Piantelli and Ficardi in the early 1990s. And we know that tritium, the second lightest fermionic nuclei is produced in Lena and this finding was attributed to Tom Clater from Los Alamos National Laboratory, formerly of. And so these are about as light nuclei as you can get. I'm saying that the, the deuteron likes to live in there because firstly it's a boson so it can occupy the same space time but it, if it forms a helium nuclei, i.e. an alpha particle, it can basically <laughs> live on top of each other because it's a, it's a boson. The collapse of the degenerate electron gas in the Coulomb field of a nucleus is analogous to the phenomena of gravitation collapse of an astrophysical object, with the mass being more than the critical one, and the shell of the degenerative relativistic gas is neutralized by the charge of the nuclei. The process involves both the nucleus and the adjoining system of degenerate electrons. The expression for the full interaction energy of electrons with the nucleus is deduced on the base of Dirac equation with a regard for both relativistic and nonlinear effects. And it looks at the hydro hydrodynamic model of a nucleus in the presence of a degenerate electron gas. And here it says, thus in the ideal situation, the external impact is required only during the initiation phase. And then the global transformation of nuclear matter under its own self-similar laws with the use of internal energy sources starts. 
Hence, the role of the first phase in the nuclear transformation is similar to the role of the first photon in a laser generation. In our opinion, the electron subsystem plays the key role during this internal self-organization process at the nuclear and subnuclear substance levels. Essentially, it's forming a very, very dense core. Then goes on to say here, pressure of this kind renders the compressed quasi-atom uh, to uh, be unstable relative to the spon spontaneous self-compression. This is a phrase, self-compression. I want you to hold this in your mind. Self-compression, self-compression of the plasma and uh, to the uh, subsequent unlimited increase in the electron density. In this case, the compression of the relativistic degenerate gas occurs without loss of its ideality the self-reinforcing process of irreversible self-compression of the degenerate electron gas is accompanied by the downfall of electron shells of the compressed quasi-atom to the nucleus. This results in the full collapse of the electron nuclear plasma in the volume of the particular weakness type cell. I don't know whether I've said that right, uh, but this is the so-called uh, cells, uh, as far as I understand it. That's about all I want to say about that presentation. I think it's about the self-similar and the self-compression that is important and that once it goes beyond a certain point, it proceeds due to its own interaction capability. So this is the main paper I want to discuss in this presentation. And there's quite a bit to read through, but I think you'll find it very interesting. And it is necessary to go through this because it draws out several points. And this is actually from 2015. What I want to note here is that George Miley is on this paper. And in fact, uh, George Miley was the one of the founding members uh, at the American Nuclear Society um, who uh, set up uh, fusion technology. And it was George Miley that had the liberal rules initially that allowed for Takaaki Matsumoto to publish his work in which he concluded something like black holes were being observed. He doesn't say there are black holes, but they look something like black holes uh, that are quite likely be doing some of the work. I would argue that they are north and south magnetic monopoles. He calls them white and black holes. Um, but anyway, uh, but the rules were changed, I think, in late 1993 or early 1994, so that uh, Matsumoto couldn't publish in there. But uh, George Miley certainly is consistent throughout this science. Uh, and the fact that he's appearing with Adamenko, I think this gives it significant uh, credibil credibility to both this document and the work of Adamenko. The other thing I want to draw, which is an interesting correlation, is uh, here. And this is uh, the book of Adamenko, which you can buy. It's not cheap. You can get it on Google Play. I think it's about $170. Uh, and it's 700 pages, so per page is quite cheap, I guess you could put it like that. And it's kind of a summary of the work that they did at the Proton 21 lab uh, in uh, the uh, former isotopic factory just outside Kiev in the Ukraine. And I just wanted to draw your attention to the list of um, advisory board on this uh, paper. You've got uh, Giancarlo Girardi, I don't know whether that's correct, but University of Trieste, Italy. Go and look up that. Lawrence P. Horowitz from Tel Aviv uh, University, Israel. Brian D. Josephson, now, I've mentioned this before, University of Cambridge, UK. I was invited to go and speak there as a maverick in science, but unfortunately before I got there, I was a little bit too maverick in my presentations in India, let's put it like that, and I was promptly uninvited. Uh, it's a shame I never got to meet him, I hope I do in the future, but anyway, uh, University of Cambridge, and then some other people here, but I wanted to point out this person, Pekka, here, and uh, he's from the University of Turku, Finland, and University of Turku, Finland is one of the partners in the Hermes project that has been funded to the tune of a little bit, I think under four million, by the European Union. So I just thought I'd, I'd draw that out. But anyway, I, I would recommend this book if you are uh, willing to look at it, uh, because it has a lot of very interesting material in there. Okay, so... 
Uh, there's some debate as to whether Lena could be anything to do with the way that suns and bodies in the cosmos are actually operating. And I can tell you, in my opinion, it completely is. Here is the words of uh, Adamenko here. One of the most fundamental processes in the universe, nucleosynthesis of elements, drives energy production in stars, as well as the creation of all atoms heavier than hydrogen. To harness this process and open new ways for energy production, we must recreate some of the extreme conditions in which it occurs. We present results of experiments using a pulsed power facility to induce collective nuclear interactions, producing stable nuclei of virtually every element in the periodic table. At the same time, even a theoretical concept of the processes in the universe responsible for the production of nuclei heavier than iron and nickel is incomplete. Like fusion models, current models of heavy element nuclear synthesis are based on pair collision mechanisms involving a capture of free neutrons by target nuclei which undergo beta decay, moving to higher atomic numbers in the periodic table. This is what a lot of people think, <laughs> and you will see theories out there that are based on this kind of thinking. Relatively slow neutron capture is called the S process and takes place in the stable interiors of massive several solar masses stars on timescales ranging from 10 million to a few billion years. Yet, if we consider the observed isotope composition of the universe, the model of S process alone can only explain the abundances of about half of heavy isotopes. Creation of the remaining isotopes is currently attributed to other pair collision type processes with the largest contribution by the rapid neutron capture or the R process, which is theorized to occur solely in type 2 core collapse supernova on much shorter timescales of a few seconds. R process models of different levels of sophistication have been constructed over the years, yet unanswered questions are by far more numerous than solved problems. So anyone claiming that it's all been solved and how the elements are produced, they just are not being honest. Okay, that being said, some answers to numerous unresolved issues in heavy element nuclear synthesis may be found in alternative theories and models. One of these models is the concept of collective nuclear interactions that suggest a nuclear synthesis mechanism occurring on very short timescales. According to this concept, collective nuclear interactions may be triggered by simultaneous acceleration of all particles in the system. If amplitude and coherency of the acceleration are high enough, these factors may significantly increase the transparency of the Coulomb barrier. In this case, contrary to pair collisions, the strong interactions will be engaged not just between two reacting nuclei, but throughout large ensembles of nuclei, which will form heavy nuclear clusters as a result of system self-organization. In any finite volume, such coherent particle acceleration cannot be sustained indefinitely. Once the acceleration starts to drop, these heavy nuclear clusters become unstable and decay into various stable isotopes. Unlike pair collision nuclear reactions that are characterized by specific nuclear products, the nuclear transmutation process driven by the collective interactions produces stable isotopes of virtually every element in the periodic table. Coherent acceleration, however, can be achieved by an action of long-range force, which can be either gravitational or electromagnetic force. I've got a note here. You cannot create instantaneous changes of long-range force of gravity. Yeah, okay. <laughs> However, in our research, we utilize the effect, the effect of an electron beam channel collapse induced by electron beam solid target interaction and beam self focusing in the dense plasma of the resultant virtual electrodes. In this paper, we describe a pulsed power laboratory experiment to test the concept of collective nuclear interactions using high power nanosecond scale electron beam pulse striking a small metallic target. 
A material analysis study shows anomalously high concentrations of new chemical elements that are present in remnants of the exploded target. These elements are spread across the board uh, of the periodic table and are detected in amounts consistent with energy balance estimations, assuming that they were formed from the original target material. So essentially they're saying, in order to involve a very large number of nuclei simultaneously, you have to have a force which is extremely intense and coherently, that is, all at the same time and in an organized fashion, gets it all into a very small volume. And you can't do that with gravity in the lab, is essentially what they're saying. So he proposed and used and successfully deployed uh, intense electromagnetic force. Now, I'm going to describe the schematic of the apparatus here with his words and then maybe some additional points so that you understand it. While a manipulation of gravitational field is unattainable in the laboratory, another type of long-range interaction due to the electromagnetic force can be reproducibly generated and controlled in a pulsed power device. Yeah, well, the expert in pulse power device, I think, was Tesla. But anyway, let's move on. Among a variety of pulsed power configurations, an electron beam setup has been selected for its ability to deliver the electromagnetic energy in a single short pulse into a relatively small volume along the central channel of a target, producing extremely dense plasma. And so they are using, effectively, the magnetic electromagnetic force. Okay? Dense plasma, if you have very hot dense plasma, you will create a lot of neutrinos, according to the work of Alexander Parkamov in this book, Space Earth Human. So, they use a 0.5 megavolt generator producing a 40 kiloamp, 20 nanosecond electron beam pulse to strike a sub millimeter anode target. The primary features of the pulse power device are capacitor energy source, the vacuum inductive storage system, and the set of plasma erosion opening switches. Pulse compression is performed by an array of 12 plasma opening switches. After the main capacitor, the plasma erosion opening switches, capacitor bank, are charged with negative polarity. The spark gap switch for the POS is triggered and the plasma is generated in the gap between the vacuum inductive storage system and the grounded outer chamber anode, creating a low resistance short circuit bridge. A few microseconds later, the spark gap for the main capacitor is triggered. The capacitor starts to discharge, accelerating current in the vacuum inductive storage system through the short circuit bridge to the ground sustained by the plasma in the POS region. An additional microsecond later, the resistance of the plasma bridge in the POS region abruptly rises by orders of magnitude on a nanosecond timescale, effectively disconnecting the short circuit plasma bridge. The inductively stored energy is promptly delivered to the vacuum diode, the relativistic vacuum diode, inducing a very narrow 20 nanosecond 0.5 megavolt voltage spike. The generated uh, electron beam is relativistic with electron velocities at 0.86 the speed of light and estimated peak power up to 12 gigawatts. Okay, so what is it essentially saying? You have a capacitor bank over attached to these plasma erosion opening switches. You have a, a, a capacitor bank here and essentially and you have a spark gap here. So you have a very, very fast uh, uh, um, means of delivering power here. Okay, so um, the, the spark goes on. This goes on, causes a, a plasma to form, which essentially causes a short circuit to ground here. Uh, the power is delivered in here. It's stored inductively in this vacuum inductive storage uh, device. And then the plasma bridge uh, stops and then all of the remaining power, because it can't go back there, goes through here into the rel relativistic uh, vacuum diode, RVD. And this is the target up here. So essentially what you're looking at is something that is remarkably <laughs> like the woodpecker of Alexander Parkamov, where he's storing in an inductor and then causing that inductor to release its energy into the target. Now, this is interesting because uh, John Hutchison told me that in addition to the uranite source, which produces gamma rays, which have been shown by the Shishkin team and by the Bogdanovich team to produce magnetic monopoles, John Hutchison also had 
a Tesla disruptive discharge coil. And this is effectively a small unit in oil uh, that is effectively a small Tesla coil uh, that uh, would effectively produce a uh, very fast high energy pulse discharge uh, between the two ter terminals. So this is producing a spark gap also. And uh, if you look at induction coils here, you can see uh, that uh, you can kind of do the same sort of thing with a Rumikoff coil here and uh, you get a very, very fast discharge. And uh, in this uh, um, presentation, which I, or, or a, a blog that I had, about two years ago, I talked about the water spark plug and the fact that uh, the anomalous energy and explosive effect um, was shown by Trowbridge uh, at Harvard University in 1907 with discharges into water vapor. So this is really completely not new. Um, and also Peter Grineau did a, a lot of work on this. But if you look at this particular device and it's using an inductor coil from a car it's one of the last places you can get an induction coil and there are several videos down here where people are using microwave diodes to uh, accelerate the speed at which the discharge occurs and this produces much larger uh, plasma uh, events this is one potential way to produce something similar now, the reason I'm mentioning this now is that whilst this is focused on the actual discharge at this point, which produce the transmutations that we'll talk at later, I, if you have these extremely fast, uh, as Tesla called them, disruptive discharges, then they, in my view, can create the magnetic monopoles. And this is the purpose of this video, as you will see as we go through it. So essentially that's how his device worked and we will go on. The cathode plate, the anode target and the accumulating screen were fabricated from ultra pure copper, 99.9999% uh, metals base purity alpha azo. Copper has two isotopes, 63 and 65. They are both quadrupole uh, and nuclear magnetic resonant nuclei and therefore in my view they would uh, relatively easily be taken into a monopole and uh, acted upon. And so this is kind of the setup. This is the discharge area. This is the kind of scale representation of the spike. This is the uh, self-focusing electron beam. And uh, this is kind of the aftermath. And this is the aftermath with the accretion disk uh, around there. So I'm just gonna pick out a few points from this. Only particles with a significant concentration of non-matrix elements, that's copper basically, show peaks using EDS because of the 1-2% to 2 detection threshold. Control screens which were not exposed to the explosion are all of uniform contrast in SEM as expected uh, of the high purity copper matrix with all original impurities uh, considerably under the limit of EDS detection. So he's got a couple of samples here. And uh, the interesting thing is, uh, uh, if you look at this green one over here, it's mostly iron and copper. And the one over here is mostly lead and copper. And what you also see are these splatters. So um, the explosion happened here and flew off in this direction. And you can see that the, the splatters on the surface have hit and then sp splayed out. So you can see that it come from the exploding target. But what I like is the fact that this is copper and these uh, splats have a, a heavier element around the outside because it's lighter, but in the center it's darker. And I would suggest that given all the data that we have, that this is likely to be carbon in the core here. This one here, where it's mostly lead, is beautiful because um, uh, I guess this is led around uh, in around this sort of area here. In the center, it's obviously darker. It looks a bit darker than the actual material here. So this could be, again, be carbon. But it has this torus effect. And if you actually look at it really closely, it's almost a pe pentagon or a hexagon in there. But anyway, those are by the by. The, the main point here is that you're seeing um, uh, lead in this one and you are seeing copper in this one. It's almost like the intensity in my view, of the self-organized cluster that did the nucleon and electron collapse was of the strength to produce lead in this case and was of the strength to produce iron in this case. 
Lead uh, is the heaviest stable element in the periodic table. Technically, bismuth is unstable. And iron is the sort of like dead zone in, in the uh, sort of you need to put more energy in if you're going to go above iron in theory. So there we go. So that's why I believe he chose those two points. In the concept of collective nucleosynthesis, the key parameter is the value of coherent particle acceleration. The peak value of this parameter in our experiment is mostly defined by the minimum diameter of the electron beam and by the beam current using the values 50 micrometers and 28 kiloamps, limiting alpha n current value for the conditions of our experiment. An order of magnitude upper bound estimate suggests that this value can exceed 10 to the 11 meters per second squared. A 1D model of a type 2 supernova yields an inward acceleration of 5 times 10 to the 9 meters per second at the core collapse stage. So it's saying that when a type 2 supernova does its business, it's two orders of magnitude lower in terms of the coherent inward collapse uh, of the material than they are able to produce in their lab. So no wonder, no wonder that they were pretty confident they were going to be able to do nuclear synthesis. And that is why I believe those very key names that you're seeing in the editorial of that book um, also believed that what he was sharing was <laughs> absolutely true. Although the temperatures and densities of supernova interior are attainable in the laboratory environment, some of the parameters such as the ion acceleration can be matched in experiment even at mid-level pulsed power facilities. So, you know, you've got two orders of magnitude there. You don't really need to work that hard. But this would explain why the woodpecker device of Alexander Parkamov is able to produce, it would seem, strange radiation and also the, the transmutation potentially. OK, we expect that nuclear transmutations produced predominantly stable isotopes, particularly the ones with the lowest binding energies. Light nuclei that are composed of alpha particles are called alpha conjugate nuclei. They have an even and equal number of protons and neutrons and are characterized by enhanced nuclear bonding. This is what we see in all of the experiments that I have observed. Basically, as I said in my Copenhagen lecture, according to my understanding, if you have a proton, it occupies one unit of space time. If you have a proton and neutron as a deuteron, it basically occupies one unit of space time. If you have a triton, it's like one proton, two neutrons. It still occupies one unit of space time within reason. And if you have two protons and two neutrons, as in a helium nuclei, it occupies one unit of space time. This is something which I was shown by Stoyan Sargachev. And in his uh, book, you can see here, if I can get it in shot, Basic Structures of Matter, Supergravitational Theory. Uh, if you look on page uh, 94, uh, you can see at the top there, maybe I can get that in shot. The proton is occupying one unit of space time. The deuteron is occupying one unit of space time. The triton is occupying one unit of space time. And the helium nuclei, that is an alpha particle, is occupying one unit of space time. And so if you are fusing a deuteron and a deuteron, basically the deuteron is disappearing into the space that a deuteron occupies. And because an alpha particle is essentially a boson, then you should be able to get them to sit on the same space time over and over and over again. So the core of this thing, in my view, is effectively an alpha particle. Uh, this effect of enhanced nuclear bonding for alpha conjugate nuclei also extends to heavier nuclei, which are more complex nuclear systems represented by alpha clusters and uh, additional valence neutrons. Uh, in Table 1, we uh, observe significant concentrations of the metals of iron group from titanium to zinc with enhanced nuclear bonding, which nuclei have an even number of protons. On the other hand, uh, measured concentrations of the iron group metals that have an odd number of protons, such as vanadium, manganese, and cobalt, are either below or slightly above their limit of quantification LOQ values. So if you have a look at that, basically they're saying that the, the vanadium and manganese and cobalt, they're basically not there, whereas the titanium, chrome, and iron are in high abundance. And this is what we saw, if you remember, 
on the titanium that had an explosive crystallization event when it was loaded with a Mars gas and then touched to polytetrafluoroethylene, which has fluorine in, which is fluorine 19, which is 100% of a very uh, high nuclear magnetic moment element you ended up with these uh, kind of like hairs and at the base uh, they had uh, uh, whatever it was, uh, iron and then chrome and then titanium or the other way around. And then at the end, it just had uh, uh, a carbon fiber uh, growing out. And so it's kind of like it ran out of spare alpha particles and then just the way it dumps alpha when it's run out of like heavier uh, uh, nuclei to layer our alpha particles into is he ends up just by dumping carbon in the central you know bit that's left over or in the ring product and uh, so carbon is left over why carbon well it's not alpha because it would be a gas i mean maybe alpha is produced and this is the alpha we see in lena as helium but the solid material that involves alpha, which is stable, is not beryllium-8 because beryllium-8 decays into 2-alpha. And so you end up with seeing 12-carbon. In all of these systems, you see a large production of uh, carbon. So anyway, we'll go back. I, I will, with extreme levels of elemental analysis data, really drive home this point of the importance of the way the active agents in Lena are able to fuse to alpha particles or fission from all the way down to elements that are predominantly alpha separated. And this was something that if we go back to the work here of Adamenko, you see the alpha separations, but also in the work of Leclerc here at Nanospire, they see these alpha separations. And as far as I understand, this is what you see when you look at stellar production or supernova production. However, this explosive type process that they are referring to here is not what I believe is the most important part of Lena. I believe that these kind of events, this self-collapsing and exploding event, which we can see the evidence for if we go back here and you look at uh, this image on the echo. This is in the echo fuel container and you have these stars, these explosive events where things come out of the exploding point. And these were called by Matsumoto stars and you had various things coming off them, including strange radiation tracks. And these, uh, I believe, are strange radiation tracks. And this effectively is producing these uh, magnetic monopoles. So it's, it's kind of a life cycle. They're made, they come together, they cause the self-collapse. They, they're an electronic structure that is built at ele electronic speeds, according to Ken Shoulders. And then uh, once they go down, they effectively create a, a bosonova, and they go, Poof! and they shoot out uh, these particles and you can see um, the product of one such uh, bosonova is what I'm showing here is these these spheres uh, that are left uh, when the, the material that was in this uh, not singularity but poten potentially the space of a nuclei and that nuclei I believe is probably the alpha nuclei um, so it's not a really infinite mass in a uh, single point it's infinite mass or very like large amount of mass in about the space of one alpha nuclei and when it explodes it releases these uh, things out uh, or these might actually be released um, uh, or pulled in because it's a monopole that's here and it's arranged itself around in, in spacing uh, around the outside of this structure in the echo fuel okay so so um, it's the monopoles that i believe are important and that is why I believe uh, Hutchison, when he was uh, wanting to produce uh, items like this, I think this is what we call splinter, I think. Uh, fr fracture sample is a smaller sample, but it has incredible evidence on it. Um, I think the use of um, the uh, gamma source and the uranite, uh, but principally the disruptive discharge coil that Hutchison had, uh, was producing sparks. The sparks were doing something similar to what is happening in Adamenko's much later work. And a proportion of neutral uh, exotic vacuum objects, which are still magnetic, are coming down. And I will do a separate video on their, their interaction with things like aluminium. They're coming down and they are aggregating in the metal. And Shoulders said they can stay in the metal indefinitely. 
And then by using electromagnetic waves and even sound, you are able to activate those. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. And I believe that if you had something like one of these induction coils or the typical induction coil uh, from a car, like uh, one of these plasma spark devices, I think you would be able to generate a device that would produce uh, EVOs if this was suitably arranged in order to charge up a prepared material. And before I go there, I want to look at evidence from the work of Adamenko that points in this direction. And this is the evidence that I shared in Sochi in the end of 2018, October. It's a little bit small, so I'm going to read it here. I call this S.V. Adamenko and the Iron Eater. We were studying the nuclear transformation products of exploded metal targets by secondary iron mass spectrometry using the CAMSIA IMS 4F. It's a very big device. We discovered a number of spots on the surface of several 99.98% pure copper accumulating screens in which no scope signals from secondary ions were recorded. Secondary ions are normally dislodged from the screen surface and should have been present given the intense bombardment of the screen by primary ions. These spots were areas with a transverse size of about 50 to 100 microns typical sizes for an exotic vacuum object that looked like irregularly shaped black spots on the display. So basically, the crux of our observation was the absence of a secondary iron flux in the scope of the entire range of iron masses analyzed by the device in the area of the black spots. In following the normal procedures for interpreting the images of iron microprobe, we can only conclude that in the case of these anomalous black spots, not only are they not composed of any of the known chemical elements, but they are also not composed of any type of previously undiscovered heavier element. In the case of our equipment, up to 480 atomic mass unit, units, which is the boundary of the range of IMS 4F. Our operators have been making observations of this kind for decades, and this was the first time I observations using this tool, and this was the first time they had encountered this type of anomaly. If it wasn't any type of known atom, then what could it possibly be? We obsessively searched all of the speciality literature for an answer, but didn't find any description of a similar phenomena ever being documented before these events. Well, I would argue that there is material out there that does kind of not with the, the iron, but certainly with the Takeaki Matsumoto work, which was around about 10 years prior to this, he was observing these structures, which were seemingly creating hawking radiation. Now, we noticed something else also, even stranger than the lack of secondary ions. We were subjecting the black spots to a heavy iron bombardment in an attempt to pick up a secondary signal when we realized that not only were we not seeing a secondary signal, but there was also a complete absence of a signal from the primary ions in the beam of the microprobe. The ions that we bombarded the spot with simply seemed to have disappeared, quite literally without a trace. At first, I refused to believe that this could even be possible because the primary ions are reflected, scattered from any surface in such a great number that the secondary image of these ions on the display is transformed always into a continuous glow on the scope's viewing screen. This omnipresent background signal is the reason that the scope's display is automatically switched off after a period of time to prevent screen burn from the primary ions as improbable as it may sound, the absence of reflected primary ions from the surface of the black spot must indicate that the primary ions arriving at the spot surface were captured by it. Now, at the time I said that this could be a black hole, according to Stephen Hawking's 22 microns of matter to initiate a black hole, that's the Planck's mass. But of course, the problem is, with the smaller the black hole gets, the faster it will evaporate. 
And so, you know, you would imagine basically it's it's not there anymore. And you couldn't just keep feeding it irons. Now, listen to what he says. In another attempt to get a signal from the spot surface, the operator gradually scanned the whole v dynamic range of masses of secondary irons accessible for, uh, to the device. This was performed a while after the primary beam was switched off. While slowly turning the knob of the device, the operator noticed a flickering spot with a decreasing intensity near 433 AMU. This flicker was positioned inside the black spot and occupied a small part of its area. And several seconds after the beginning of the observation, the brightness of the flickering spot decreased to zero, i.e. the luminous spot against the background of the black area disappeared. We repeated the new experiment by switching the beam on again for several minutes and again switching it back off. The image of a flickering spot at mass of 4.33 AMU arose with the same initial brightness and again disappeared from view within several seconds. In both cases, the boundaries of the black spot were invariable. Okay, so they are firing. What's typically used in this Cam Kamika IMS 4F is ions of cesium, and that's monoisotopic stable cesium, which is 133. The reason you want to use a, a heavy accelerated iron is that it can smash off other ions from the surface of whatever material it is you're analyzing, and they come in and are detected. And so that's why you use heavy elements. Cesium-133 is a nuclear magnetic resonant nuclei, and so it could be captured by, in my view, a monopole. And the monopole could be doing a number of things. One, it's crushing it into a very, very heavy thing and then spitting it out. And or two, you are seeing uh, this emission of uh, this glow um, because it's basically eating the material. Certainly, they're not seeing anything other than that when they are firing these ions in. After repeating this power cycling and observation routine 12 times, we established that the initial luminous intensity of the 433 AMU spot after a pause was proportional to the duration of the pause. And the decrease in luminosity intensity as it faded from view had an exponential character. So there's a lot of information there. And this, I think, is for me, more valuable than the other material that I have read of his work, really. I think it's stunning, in fact. During the analysis of another black spot with the use of ionic microprobe, the operator observed a pattern similar to that described above, but different in that the luminosity arose not inside the black spot, but instead occurred in a non-uniform manner along the length of the black spot's winding boundary. So you can see it up here. And this is actually is at atomic mass 63, which is actually copper. Um, but you've got this boundary. So some, some emissions are coming out uh, from here. Uh, and it's throwing in cesium. And um, they've got the atomic mass set at 63. So it's all a bit weird. However, this kind of irregular ring with spots around it looks remarkably like a uh, shoulders bead chain. And here's a bead chain that is then broken up and bits have gone off and they've released other material. This is a bead chain from the outside of the quartz uh, in the Lion 2 reactor. So you can see the, the things here. So if you had monopoles that were eating the quartz here and that this was a metal rather than, than what it is, I'm saying that the monopoles are trapped, as Shoulders says, in the metal indefinitely. And that if you feed it, you fire ions into it, then uh, it's able to consume them uh, and or arrange them into different matter. And I believe that that is the kind of thing that we are observing when we were shooting electrons, in this case, into um, the structures on the outside of the uh, changed uh, material on the outside of the Lyons uh, reactor. So um, this, for me, along with the fact that weeks after the Focardi Piantelli high neutron event, uh, which was caused by protons interacting with vanadium-50, uh, producing neutrons. Um, and they, they got that rod, that nickel rod back uh, from the nuclear authority or whatever it was weeks later, and they put it in a cloud chamber and they saw these protons, high energy protons being emitted. We have Adamenko saying that the process 
in, in, in this process of collapsing matter into more dense matter will produce energy through the condensation of the matter, but it will also eject uh, lighter nuclei. And so <laughs> what's lighter than 433? I don't know, but <laughs> it's pretty heavy. So whatever's maybe in this one is really, really heavy. And uh, why this was ejecting potentially 63 or, or photons or whatever it was, Certainly, the, the idea of ejecting protons to me is, is, is a, a, a lot easier, and tritons uh, as well. But I, I'm saying that in this case, unlike the fact that when he is using his experiment normally, uh, he is uh, shooting, uh, um, he's having this relativistic discharge into here, and he's producing these transmutations in this event that's two orders of magnitude higher uh, coherent uh, compression than you get in type 2 supernova, okay? He's getting stuff that's coming out and it's then finding itself trapped in the copper accretion disk. And then it is still active a long time after the experiment has concluded and it's able to interact with matter. Now, I'm saying that in the case of something like John Hutchison, he was creating magnetic monopoles. These were being produced uh, by uh, uh, his disruptive discharge coil. They were aggregating in the uh, aluminium, and then he could uh, stimulate them by using RF. And that is because if you have nuclei trapped in a magnetic monopole, and the, and the nuclei are, say, 27 aluminium, which is quadrupole nuclear magnetic material, you can use RF to energize the nuclei in there because it's in a strong magnetic field. And I think it's relating to the frequency of the RF. So I think if it's a very strong magnetic uh, um, field, you need a higher frequency RF. Someone might like to challenge me on that. So I'm working with Philip Power to integrate uh, the NMR moments of various uh, uh, nuclei into the Parkamov inspired MFMP reaction tables. And hopefully um, this will add further insight into what is going on in Lena. Lastly, I wanted to talk about the Parkamov uh, nickel. This is carbonyl nickel from Parkamov's reactor that was looked at by Bob Higgins. This has dendritic structures, and the dendritic structures, the, the spike of them at a, a temperature, uh, which may be resonant or whatever, um, they can uh, effectively cause, you know, electron cloud around the outside, and you end up with a situation where you get a columbic explosion, and this synthesizes the exotic vacuum objects, and these can go on to make the magnetic monopoles. And I discuss here at this point in this presentation when I'm replying to a question by Peter Hegelstein that essentially once you've made the active agents, these magnetic monopoles, it doesn't matter if the material later sinters or melts because that's actually advantageous because the magnetic monopole can then move around and, and aggregate and form larger magnetic monopoles, which can then eat the uh, liquid material that's uh, uh, available to it uh, because it likes to suck the electrons in and it can uh, bring the uh, resulting ions in as well and do its work with those. And it's actually Parkamov that established that if you have uh, lithium from lithium aluminium hydride coating the surface of the nickel, you don't get the excess heat effects. And I believe that's because the dendritic spikes cannot do this columbic explosion, producing the EVOs, producing the magnetic monopoles that are able to do the work in this type of system. Now, this is uh, from a presentation, which is the New Fire's 100-year uh, gestation. And uh, I have this uh, shirt here, uh, which uh, I quite uh, like. Uh, and now you might be able to understand uh, the significance of it. We have pulsed uh, 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 toroids of a, a sort of a... Uh, hydrodynamic but fluid dynamic structures that are going to aggregate and we have a torus here and we have the uh, um, birdies which we've got in the center there. So I wore this and I even wore this all, all the way back for many years. You can see it here in the, I'm wearing it here in the brilliant light shower image here. Now the reason I'm, I'm showing you this is because these are events which occurred when we were testing Suhas Raukar's 
device, uh, his uh, device where he first observed these kind of transmutation effects. And we had these explosive events which caused the power system to trip out. And they have this kind of glow color here, which is maybe it's hydrogen line plasma. I don't know, but this is from a water spark plug. And the, the water spark plug is here, but the plasmoid is over here. And this looks remarkably like the observation of Bagdanovich, which was published in a peer-reviewed paper last year. So if I can find that here. So this was published in 2019, and it was submitted October 23rd, 2018. And here you see uh, from their long-term work, a long period of time, you have these um, glowing objects in free space away from the actual water flow plasma discharge. And here is one of those types of objects that was apparently caught on film and videoed. And here we have a spark plug using this uh, uh, very intense, uh, short duration uh, discharges that's coming from an induction coil. And water has been sprayed on this. And for, oh, this is the spark plug here. And here is the event. And if you actually look at this uh, structure, uh, perhaps I can just the, the uh, uh, exposure. This does, to me, in my mind, look pretty similar to this, and it's moving along the sort of uh, surface here, which is how it's described by Bogdanovich. So was this the first time that this is witnessed? Is it a replica? I have to thank uh, Juni Tuomla for observing this here and other instances of it uh, way back when I made this presentation two years ago. So thank you for that, Juni. But there it is. There it is. Are we seeing this same thing? This would imply to me that the type of water spark discharge uh, may be useful in this type of experiment. So how I'm going to conclude is I want to talk about uh, something else which I shared in this presentation, which was the 1994 awarded Canon patent for cold fusion. Essentially, if I go up a couple of slides, by repeatedly applying voltages minus 5 and minus 500 in cycles of about 5 minutes for about 50 hours, about a 20-fold emission of gamma rays was detected uh, against the gamma rays detection background. So if there are groups out there, like the Hermes group, like the Clean HME group, that wants a way, if they have to deal with palladium deuterium, they can use palladium in here, deuterium occluded. I explained in this video what you need to do to the material, the shapes and the forms of the, material, uh, of the structures on the surface that you need, that in this pattern, they also talk about using powders, and this is in 1994. They talk about using hydrogen storage or occluding powders, and uh, this is the heat extraction device. And what they're doing is they have a capacitor-based discharge between here. They run this for, say, about an hour, and they produce hydrogen radicals. I don't believe that's what that's actually happening. What they're producing is a lot of exotic vacuum objects, which include the argon and which include the hydrogen isotope that they have in here. Now, additionally, they preloaded the and included the hydrogen isotope onto this uh, hydrogen storage member. And so when they, what they do is they then put a negative 500 volts here or whatever, or fi positive 500 volts, what it is. Yeah, uh, minus 500 volt. Yeah, maybe it's positive, I don't know. But anyway, they, they need to pull a variation in the potential on here. You could drive into or out from the surface uh, the exotic vacuum objects. I think there's an interaction going on here. And I, I don't think this is the optimal way to do it. I would choose to have xenon in there because it has a lower ionization energy and it's a heavier nuclei, so it's more able to stabilize larger exotic vacuum objects. I would use deuterium preferentially in there because it's already a boson, although proton has this NMR moment. And so if you have these magnetic monopoles, uh, tritium is also very good for this. And I would choose titanium here because it's just cheaper than palladium uh, or even nickel either would do. But this technology, when you look at it, is more precise in that you can control it. You're doing a spark. But this is essentially what Hutchinson is doing. He has his spark gap here uh, with his disruptive discharge Tesla device with the, with the spark gap there. He's loading up his metals. The Evos are capturing whatever they captured when the spark happened, and then they get in here and they start taking on board some of the aluminium atoms. And then they are using RF to spin them up and to energize them and to let them do work. And so there you have it. 
So you can use this pattern, it's free to use. Everything I've said in this video is free to use. To close out this video, this is the Proton Scientific Lab. This is one of the, the classic pieces of apparatus they have. And here they have a history and vision. And so we've got some update here. And that is that they did peak modeling of electron beam focusing and propagating in the solid target continues. Magneto hydrodynamics modeling of the fusion fuel compression begins. So this is fluid dynamics modeling. Proton scientific pulse power facility has re been relocated to Oak Ridge Laboratory, I should assume, at Tennessee. Um, and there we go. And, and then between 2018 to 2019, plasma characterization through advanced diagnostics and modeling to optimize the uh, electron beam uh, focusing or whatever it is, uh, fusion rather, electron beam fusion process and target parameters will continue. Validation tests will be conducted towards a development uh, of the scaled electron beam fusion reactor prototype to achieve fusion burn with a maximum net energy gain. Blueprints of the EBF reactor facility will be completed by our Fortune 500 contractor. 2020 to 2021, full assembly and testing of the EBF energy production prototype, conceptual design of the power plant, end goal, developing and building full scale electron beam fusion power plant. Well, they can do it, they will do it. And one last thing, our team. Down here, you have George Miley. Thank you, and I will see you in the next video.